Hey, Manager of Accounting students, we're going to dive right into Chapter 1. Chapter 1 is only 50 slides, but there's a lot of information in here, so try to stay with me all the way through. There's some really critical information, even at the very end of the chapter. So first, kind of in review, financial accounting versus managerial accounting. Hopefully you're crystal clear on that from the prologue, uh, but financial accounting, once again, is more uh, concerned with external users, so investors and creditors, and they need to provide timely and accurate financial statements to those parties. So financial accounting is looking at external users, while well, managerial accounting is concerned with internal information, so providing information to managers within the organization so that they can plan, control, and make decisions. So a big topic that we're going to be looking at in chapters one, and then we'll be applying it through chapter two and really the rest of the semester is cost classification. So in this chapter, we're going to review a lot of different types of costs. And one thing I want to make clear is that these different uh, cost classifications are not always mutually exclusive. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that later as we go. So we're going to look at assigning costs to cost objects. We're going to look at accounting for costs in a manufacturing company. So that's kind of new. In financial accounting, we dealt with service companies and merchandising companies. So manufacturing is new, and it will be our primary focus in uh, managerial accounting this semester. We're going to look at preparing financial statements. So hopefully that's old news, but we've got some new statements to throw in there in this manufacturing setting. Predicting cost behavior in response to changes in activity, and that's a topic that we'll touch on today and then we'll follow up on later, particularly in Chapter 5, and using costs to make decisions. So here we go. We're going to start by understanding cost classifications used for assigning costs to cost objects. So first we'll look at direct cost versus indirect cost. So a direct cost is one that can be easily and conveniently traced to a unit of product or another cost object. Um, so if we're thinking in a manufacturing setting, so if we're making something, the costs that are easily and conveniently traced to each unit of product that we're making. Um, so the direct material that goes into making each unit of product, the direct labor that goes into each unit of product. So these keywords, direct costs, are going to include direct material and direct labor. When it comes to indirect costs, those are costs that cannot be easily and conveniently traced to a unit of product or other cost object. So examples of that would be manufacturing overhead. Well, that's probably a new term for you too, so I'm not sure that totally helps answer the question. Um, when we talk about a manufacturing company, Manufacturing overhead is all of the costs that go into the manufacturing process but aren't really direct to each unit of product. So it's the overhead for running that manufacturing facility. Um, it could include the rent on the facility, the insurance, the utilities, the property taxes, the depreciation. I mean, the list could go on of all of these other costs of running this manufacturing facility or plant or some type of factory operation. And all of those go into manufacturing overhead or what we call MO, M-O. Um, going back to this definition, costs that cannot be easily and conveniently traced to a unit of product. Some of you might just throw your hands up and say, hey, there's nothing easy or convenient about any of this. Everything's an indirect cost. Um, maybe not the best route. The point here is that if we are capable of figuring out how much materials and labor go into a unit of product, then that's direct. If we have to start doing a ton of higher math and allocating and guesstimating, then it might be an indirect cost. Um, as we talk about indirect costs, here they note it's incurred to support a number of different cost objects. These cost objects cannot be traced to any individual cost object. Um, 
So what's an example of that? So I listed some ideas of manufacturing overhead like rent, utilities, insurance, property taxes. Um, but we also have something called indirect materials. So that would be an indirect cost as well. So what's indirect materials? Well, it would be some type of material or supplies that are consumed in the manufacturing process that don't become an integral part of whatever we're producing. So it could be like um, oil used to um, lubricate a manufacturing machine or cleaning supplies for a certain machine, um, something that gets consumed in that uh, manufacturing process but doesn't become part of the actual object that we're building. Next, we need to look at our three basic manufacturing costs, and we've actually already touched on them. Direct materials, direct labor, and MO, manufacturing overhead. So just a quick definition of each of those. Direct materials are raw materials that become an integral part of the product and that can be conveniently traced directly to it. So if we're making automobiles in a automobile manufacturing plant, the radio installed in the automobile. We know exactly what that is. We know that there's one per vehicle and we can easily and conveniently trace it to each unit of product that we're making. Direct labor. Direct labor costs are those labor costs that can be easily traced to individual units of product. So the wages that we pay to automobile assembly workers, the ones that are directly working on the line making the vehicles. So whatever we pay those workers is direct labor for making those vehicles. Now there are other workers like indirect labor and we'll touch on that in just a moment under MO, manufacturing overhead. So manufacturing overhead includes all manufacturing costs except direct material and direct labor. So this is really kind of a big cost bucket if you'll think of it that way. These costs cannot be readily traced to finished products. So let me read that first part again. This is important. Manufacturing overhead includes all manufacturing costs except direct material and direct labor. So if it's not direct material, direct labor, then everything else is MO. So what are some examples? So this would include our indirect materials, which I just explained, like um, oil, grease, lubricants on machines. So it's a material and we use it up in the process, but it doesn't become a part of the vehicle. So it's not part of the finished product. Indirect labor. How about the janitor in the factory? How about the floor supervisor who's not actually working on the vehicles, um, but is being paid to be there and oversee everything? How about security at the facility? So those are all labor costs, but they're not directly working on each unit of product, and therefore they'd be classified as indirect labor and go under MO. So other examples of MO, as we discussed briefly, um, depreciation of our manufacturing equipment, utilities, property taxes, insurance premiums. And I want to clue you in. There's a long list of things that could go for manufacturing overhead. But the key is that it has to say depreciation of manufacturing equipment, not equipment at corporate offices. Um, it could be all of these things, but it has to be for the factory facility or the manufacturing facility. Sometimes your textbook likes to slip in there something like utilities at the corporate headquarters. Um, that's not going to qualify as MO. These things are only MO if they're related to the manufacturing facility. So only those indirect costs associated with operating the factory are included in MO. So anytime they throw in something about corporate headquarters or uh, office, um, that doesn't belong in MO. That's going to go somewhere else, and we'll address that later. Before we move on from MO, um, we're going to be talking about MO a lot this semester, and we need to get a little bit uh, clearer picture of what MO is. What type of account is MO? Hmm, that's a tricky question. I'm sure if we were in the classroom, I would hear you shouting out, mm, it's an expense, it's a liability, it's an asset, it's, um, well, we know it's not income. What is it? Well, let me help you with that. MO 
is kind of like an asset. It acts like an asset. It smells like an asset. It walks like an asset. Um, so we're going to treat it like an asset. But the answer is it's going to disappear before we get to the point of doing financial statements. But it's going to act like an asset, um, meaning that it increases with a debit and decreases with a credit. Um, so in terms of journal entries and T accounts, um, it acts like an asset. But again, I referred to it earlier as kind of a cost bucket. Mo is a giant cost bucket where we dump all of these costs during the operating period. But by the end of the period, we have to empty that bucket out. And we'll deal with where we're going to empty that bucket out to later. But you're never going to find manufacturing overhead in your um, financial statements. It's not going to show up on an income statement or a balance sheet. It's not on your statement of cash flows. It's not on your statement of changes in stockholders' equity. So it's an account that we're going to use a lot. It acts like an asset, but it's going to disappear before we get to the point of financial statements. We will revisit that later when we learn more about our Mo bucket and how to empty it out. So next we have prime cost and conversion costs. And these are important terms for you to learn. Um, it's essentially grouping together our three manufacturing costs. So if we take direct labor, excuse me, direct materials plus direct labor, that equals our prime costs. And I think of those, the two directs as our prime input. So direct material, direct labor is our prime cost. And then direct labor and manufacturing overhead are our conversion costs. So what we have to do to the direct material to convert it. So direct labor and mo are the conversion costs. So if I just add together prime cost plus conversion cost, that would give me my total manufacturing cost, right? Mm, no, we'd be double counting our direct labor, right? So um, make sure you learn this and learn it well. Um, it's not super hard, but it's an important one to have in your brain. And later we're going to be doing some math problems, um, kind of a little bit of light algebra maybe using this terminology. So we'll get to that later on. Non-manufacturing costs. So we know direct material, direct labor, and mo are manufacturing costs, and therefore everything else is a non-manufacturing cost. So we go back to selling an admin. So selling an admin cost, which you should be familiar with from financial accounting, um, are just going to be expensed in the period in which they are incurred. And I say that because that's a little different than Mo, and I'm going to go back and talk about Mo for a moment here too. Um, so selling and admin costs get expensed in the period in which they're incurred. Do you remember the matching concept? We want to match our expenses to the period in which they are incurred. So um, selling costs include costs necessary to secure the order and deliver the product. They can neither be direct or indirect. So. This is what I was saying about these different cost classifications don't have to be mutually exclusive. So we've broken things out into direct and indirect, manufacturing and non-manufacturing. So here we have a non-manufacturing cost and it could be either direct or indirect. Administrative costs similarly, they include all executive, organizational and clerical costs. And again, administrative costs can either be direct or indirect. And, um, those classifications um, about direct or indirect, meaning can we conveniently trace it to each unit of product? So for a selling cost, maybe it's shipping goods to a customer. So we know how much that costs and we can trace it to that unit of product. So that would be direct. Where we might have other indirect things like overall um, an advertising or marketing campaign that falls under selling costs, but we can't trace that to each unit of product. So what I wanted to touch on, I mentioned non-manufacturing costs like selling and admin are going to be expensed in the period in which they're incurred. Well, what about the manufacturing costs? I'm going to roll back just for a second. When we talk about these manufacturing costs, and we talked about the concept of the Mo bucket, and all of these costs are going to be gathered together in the Mo bucket under manufacturing overhead, when did those get expensed? 
Well, it's not in the period in which they're incurred. And this is what makes accounting in a manufacturing setting a little bit more tricky. We're gonna hold all of these costs involved with Mo as an asset. Remember we said it's gonna act like an asset. So we're gonna put in there our rent, our utilities, our depreciation, our property taxes, our insurance, and a ton of other things that go into Mo, indirect materials, indirect labor. And all of that's gonna be treated as an asset. So increasing assets on our balance sheet. That seems kind of strange, right? Do we really have more stuff? Well, what's gonna happen with all those costs in the Mo bucket is that they're gonna be attached. They're gonna be assigned to each unit of product. And we're gonna learn how to do that later. We're gonna deal with that in chapter two, three, and four, and look at how to assign Mo to our products. Um, but it's all gonna be held as, a pro as an asset. And then as we finish the product, we're gonna attach or apply Mo to each unit of product. And then when we sell the product, then we expense the Mo. And we'll deal with that a little bit later as we look at journal entries related to this. But keep in mind Mo is a big asset bucket and we're gonna hold it as an asset until we sell the product that it's associated with. Now there's all kinds of theory questions in there. Do you really feel like, let's say that we make a bunch of units of product and we don't sell them for six months. Do you really feel like depreciation, utilities, and property taxes from six months ago should be held as an asset on our balance sheet? Hmm. I can make a strong argument that those should have been expensed in the period in which they're incurred, but because they're manufacturing overhead, we treat them differently and we put them in the Mo bucket so they remain as an asset until we sell each unit of product. So that's kind of an interesting thing with Mo. There's all kinds of things in here that seem like big period expenses that should be expensed in the proper period, but instead we hold them as an asset. So again, I'm kind of just touching the tip of the iceberg here. We'll deal with that concept more in a later chapter as well. Um, definitely some interesting accounting theory in there, but that is the correct way of doing it. So let me get us back to where we were um, we need to understand product cost versus period cost, which is a lot of what I was just talking about. A product cost includes all of the costs that are involved in acquiring or making a product. Hopefully you remember that term from financial accounting. Um, if you were in my course, I defined it as any cost incurred to obtain the product and ready it for resale. So now that we're switching into a manufacturing setting, that's gonna inc include all of the costs of acquiring the product or making the product and readying it for reset. And again, what I was trying to explain about Mo, all of these product costs are going to attach to the unit of product as it is purchased or manufactured, and then it stays attached to each unit of product as long as it remains in inventory awaiting sale. And again, inventory is an asset. So again, we're gonna hold the product cost as an asset on our balance sheet until we sell it. So in manufacturing, the product cost that we might see would include raw materials. So any materials that go into making the final product, work in process or WIP. I know you guys were hoping for more acronyms in your life, right? So we've got MO is manufacturing overhead, WIP is work in process, and that consists of units of product that are only partially complete and will require further work before they're ready for sale to the customer. So it's a type of inventory and it's gonna stay on our balance sheet until we actually finish it then sell it. And then we have our finished goods, which consists of completed units of product that have not been sold to customers. So all three of these are different types of inventory. Really, they're subcategories of inventory. So raw materials is a type of inventory. Whip is a type of inventory. Finished goods is a type of inventory. And again, inventory is an asset. So all of this is stuff we have. It's going to increase assets on our balance sheet. So what happens? The transfer of product costs. When direct materials are used in production, those costs get transferred from raw materials into WIP. And then direct labor and MO are added into WIP. 
That's what we have to do to those direct materials to convert it. Remember, those are our conversion costs, direct labor and mo. And we work on that product. And so as we work on it, that whip becomes finished goods. So once those units of product are complete, then they're moved from whip into finished goods. And then finally, when we sell it, then it's moved from finished goods to cost of goods sold. Do you remember that account from financial accounting? Cost of goods sold or COGS. And that's an expense account on the income statement. So I'm hoping that you can kind of picture the, the T accounts or maybe journal entries that would be going with this. So we're using raw materials. So those raw materials will move from raw materials into WIP. And then we're going to add in our direct labor and our MO into WIP as we work on the product. And then when we finish it, it goes from whip to finished goods. And then when we sell it, it goes from finished goods, which is an asset on the balance sheet. And then we finally transfer it to cost of goods sold. So what's happening here? The product costs, including those direct materials, direct labor and mo, are all sitting as inventory on the balance sheet. And then when we sell it, it goes into cost of goods sold, the expense account on the income statement. That's important to remember. Um, really, it's an application of the matching concept. Now, I know for those of you that were in my financial, class, financial accounting class, you know how I love the matching concept. It's my favorite gap. And I trust that you have been waking up every day and reciting the matching concept as you spring out of bed in the morning, right? Okay, maybe not. And for those of you that weren't in my financial accounting class, let's review the matching concept real quick. So the matching concept has three parts. First, we want to match our revenue to the period in which it is earned. Second, we want to match our expenses to the period in which they are incurred. And then third part, the one that applies here, we want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. And so that's what we're doing here. We don't expense all of that product cost to COGS until we have a sale of the product. So we're matching the sales revenue to the cost of goods sold. So we're doing them at the same time. We don't want to just immediately expense everything. We want the COGS to match to the sales. And we'll deal with the journal entries for that later. But I'm hopeful that you all remember your journal entries, particularly from chapter four of financial accounting, your merchandising entries, where you learn how to record a sales entry with part A and part B. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and brush up on that. Make sure you remember part A and B, and we'll dive into that more um, in, a, in a later chapter. Um, so that's product cost. Then we have period costs, and these are all the costs that just get expensed in the period in which they are incurred. So that would include all of our sell and administrative costs. We expense them in the time frame in which they happen, in the accounting period in which they're incurred. So that's an application of the second part of the matching concept that says we want to expense or we want to match our expenses to the period in which they're incurred. So we're definitely following the matching concept here, but different theories where product costs get expensed when we make the sale and period costs get expensed in the period, the time period that they belong to. Let's try this. Which of the following costs would be considered a period cost rather than a product cost in a manufacturing company? Hmm. I'll give you a moment to think about it. So anything related to the manufacturing is going to be a product cost, right? So we could probably eliminate a manufacturing equipment depreciation, even though it's depreciation, it has to do with manufacturing. So it's going to be mo. it's going to be a product cost. C, direct materials, that's a product cost, so we could probably eliminate that one. What do you think about D, electrical cost to light the production facility? And that's going to be MO as well, so that's going to be product cost. The answers, there's two answers. 
Oh, you didn't know you could have two answers? Okay, you can have two answers this time. So B, property taxes on corporate headquarters, and there's your keywords. Had it said property taxes on the manufacturing facility, then it would be a product cost. But because it says corporate headquarters, that makes it a period cost. It doesn't attach to each unit of product, and instead we're just going to expense it in the period in which it's incurred. And then E, sales commissions. So sales commissions are part of our selling and admin expense. It's not part of making the product, it's part of selling the product, so we expense it when it happens. Does that make sense? All right, next we're gonna move on to predicting cost behavior. So we're going to look at different cost classifications that help us understand cost behavior. So we're gonna be looking at variable cost, fixed costs, and then mixed costs, which are really variable and fixed costs combined. And I'm gonna give you a heads up here. Ultimately, it's gonna become your responsibility. Anytime you see a mixed cost, it's gonna be your job to break it down into its variable and fixed components. So when we see a mixed cost, almost always we have to break it down into variable plus fixed. So what is a variable cost? It's a cost that varies. <laughs> That's a great statement. A variable cost is a cost that varies in total, in direct proportion to changes in the level of activity. A cost that varies in total, in direct proportion to changes in the level of activity. So as we make more and more widgets, we're going to be using up more and more widget material. As we make more and more widgets, we're going to incur more direct labor. So those would be direct, excuse me, those would be variable costs that are going to vary in proportion to changes in the level of activity. If we make fewer widgets, we're going to use up fewer direct materials. If we make fewer widgets, we'll have less direct labor. So those are truly variable costs that are, that are going to vary in direct proportion. Now when we say um, changes in the level of activity. Well, how do we measure a level of activity, which takes us to this concept, concept of an activity base or a cost driver. What is causing cost to happen? So a cost driver is a measure of what causes the incurrence of a variable cost. So it could be the number of units produced if we're talking about widgets. It could be the number of machine hours. So how many hours are the machines running, producing whatever we make? What are the labor hours that go into a particular um, product that we're making? So if we work more and more hours, we're incurring more costs. Or in some cases, it could be something like miles driven. Um, there's actually quite a lot of different activity bases or cost drivers. Um, and we'll take a deeper look at that in a later chapter. I'm not gonna get into all that right now, but these are your most common ones. Most often we're gonna be looking at things like machine hours, units produced, labor hours. Those will be your most common three that we'll take a look at. So when we think of our variable costs, as we produce more units, we incur more costs. So those are truly variable costs. As we work more hours, we incur more costs. So that cost driver is causing the incurrence of the variable cost. Moving on to fixed cost, a fixed cost is one that remains constant in total, regardless of changes in the level of activity. So if expressed on a per unit basis, the average fixed cost per unit varies inversely with changes in activity. So think about something like rent on the manufacturing facility. It's fixed for the month. We know that it's $20,000 for the month. And whether we make zero units of, of widgets or 100 units of widgets or 100,000 units of widgets, the rent is going to be 20,000. It doesn't go up or down because we made more units of product or less units of product. Does that make sense? When it comes to fixed costs, some are really fixed and some are less fixed. Is that, that seems kind of weird, right? So um, let me explain a little bit more on that topic. So different types of fixed costs, we have committed versus discretionary. 
So a committed fixed cost is a long-term fixed cost that cannot be significantly reduced in the short term. So something like depreciation on your equipment or property taxes on your manufacturing plant. What can you do to change those things? Not a whole lot. It really wasn't up to you in the first place and now you're stuck with these long-term fixed costs. You don't have control over it. There's not much you can do. If you want them to go away, then you have to get rid of the equipment or get rid of the manufacturing plant to get rid of the property taxes that go with it. So those would be some serious committed fixed costs. But what about discretionary? We can have discretionary fixed costs. Maybe we've decided that, um, and it doesn't have to be manufacturing to be fixed. Let's say that we have um, an advertising contract and we paid $10,000 for the year for this advertising contract, but we get halfway through the year and we decide that, you know what, we don't really need that anymore. So we're going to cut back on advertising going forward. So we can make short term um, managerial decisions and make changes to some of these costs. So we do have a little bit more control over some of these things. So those are discretionary fixed costs. Still fixed. Um, when we talk about fixed costs, you're often going to hear us follow it up with within the relevant range. And what that is referring to, I know that sounds kind of strange, um, what that's referring to, though, is essentially this green area on this chart. What are we looking at here? So let's take a step back. Um, so we've got our y-axis, that is the total cost, and our x-axis, that is our level of activity. And so the green line here, it's a curve, right? They call it the economist's curvilinear cost function. Do you want to write the equation for that? Mm, I'm going to take a pass on that right now. So what we see is that costs increase rapidly to start. So as we start making units of product, there's a bit of a learning curve. There's a bit of initial costs that go into it. And then they level off in this middle portion. And then as we exceed the relevant range, they jump up again. So let's imagine that we're running a widget plant and we're making widgets. So if we make just a few units of widgets, those fixed costs are only spread over those few units. So they're quite expensive. But as we make more and more of them, we kind of hit the sweet spot. So here we're just making 100, 200, 1,000 widgets. But then as we get going, we're more efficient and all of the units of product are sharing in the company's fixed costs. But then let's say that we, uh, we exceed the capacity of our facility. We can't make that many widgets given this limited space. And now we have to get a bigger manufacturing facility. We need more equipment, more space, more storage. And therefore, our costs start going up again once we exceed that relevant range. Now, when it comes to accounting, we look at this curve and we're like, you know what? We're not into this higher math kind of stuff. There's a math class for that, and we don't much care for doing that. So we're going to draw this nice little red line right through there, and it's a pretty close approximation of that curvilinear cost function. And we're going to call that area in the middle the relevant range. So that's the accountant's straight line approximation. So a straight line closely approximate approximates a curvilinear variable cost line within that relevant range. So anytime we talk about our fixed costs, it has to be within the relevant range. If we exceed the relevant range, then it's not valid anymore. So the relevant range of activity pertains to fixed costs as well as variable costs. For example, assume office space is available at a rental rate of $30,000 per year in increments of 1,000 square feet. So our fixed costs would increase in a step fashion at a rate of $30,000 for each additional 1,000 square feet. So if we were to graph that, if we need to rent 1,000 square feet, then it's going to be $30,000. But if we need 1,200 square feet, guess what? That's not an option. We're going to jump up to here. Then we're renting 2,000 square feet, and that's going to cost us $60,000 and so on. 
So the relevant range of activity for a fixed cost is the range of activity over which the graph of the cost is flat. So speaking of graphs, if we were to look at variable costs and fixed costs, and we talk about variable costs in total and variable costs per unit, we need to be able to visualize what that looks like. What does that mean? So our variable costs in total, the total variable cost will increase and decrease in proportion to changes in the activity level. If we were to graph that, it would look like this. There we go. So we've got a little upward sloping line. So as we produce more units of activity, our costs on the y-axis are going up. So it's a straight upward sloping line. Okay. On a per unit basis though, our variable costs per unit are going to remain constant. So it's $5 of materials for every single unit we produce. So our graph would look like, try to squeeze my graph in there where you can actually see it. So again, activities on the x-axis, our variable cost is going to remain constant. So it's flat on a per unit basis. So it's $5 per unit. It stays flat, whether it's the first unit or the 100th unit, it's still $5 per unit. How about fixed costs? Our total fixed cost is not affected by changes in the activity level within the relevant range. So our fixed costs are fixed. You're going to hear me say that more than once. Our fixed costs are fixed. So that would look like this on a graph. So our rent is $20,000 a month. Doesn't matter how many units we make, it's $20,000. It's flat. So the fixed costs are fixed. But if we look at fixed costs on a per unit basis, the fixed cost per unit decreases as the activity level rises and increases as the activity level falls. So what's that one going to look like? That's a little bit different, right? That one is actually a curve. So our fixed cost per unit decreases as the activity level rises and increases as the activity level falls. So again, our level of activity on the x-axis and our total cost, our fixed cost on the y-axis. So if we have to pay $10,000 a month for rent, if we make zero units, it's still going to be $10,000. But if we make only one unit per month, then that one unit has to absorb $10,000 worth of rent. Now that seems crazy, right? So then if we make two units, then that then they each have $5,000 of fixed rent attached to them. What if we make three units? Then they each have $3,333 of rent. How about four units, five units, 10 units, right? We could keep going. Will this curve ever actually hit the x-axis? Do you remember what that's called? There's a mathematical term for that. It starts with an A. I'll let you get back to me on that one. I won't give it away. It's too much fun. Um, so it's going to be this downward sloping curve. I would encourage you guys, make sure you study this. I know it's a little bit hard with the words, but I like to add in the, the graphs, the pictures with it. But try to think of an example that goes with each of these. So variable in total, variable per unit, fixed in total, fixed per unit, and be able to associate them with what that graph looks like. All right, your turn. Quick check number two. Which of the following costs would be variable with respect to the number of ice cream cones sold at Baskin and Robbins? It kind of sounds like Baskin Robbins. Ice cream sounds good right now. Uh, there may be more than one correct answer. Well, that's good to know. So which of the following would be variable with respect to the number of ice cream cones sold? I'll give you a moment to think about it. cost of lighting the store. We're going to turn the lights on whether we sell a lot of cones or just a few cones, right? Pretty sure. How about wages of the store manager? They're probably hourly or maybe salaried, but
but their wages don't go up or down depending on how much ice cream they sell, right? So that's not variable with respect to the number of cones. How about the cost of ice cream? Now here I think they're referring to like the cost of goods sold on the ice cream. So if we sell more ice cream cones, then our cost of goods sold on ice cream is gonna go up. And if we sell fewer ice cream cones, then we won't incur as much cost of goods sold. How about D, the cost of napkins for customers? If we sell more ice cream, should we expect to have customers use more napkins? Yeah. Now we may not know the exact formula of how many napkins per ice cream cone, but I'm sure we can get that figured out. But it does vary in proportion to the ice cream cones sold. So hopefully you picked C and D. So now we're finally gonna move on to mixed cost. And this might look a little scary to you, kinda of looks like we're back in our pre-algebra or algebra class here, right? Mixed cost. A mixed cost contains both variable and fixed elements. So if we're talking about, for example, utilities. There's a fixed monthly utility charge just for the privilege of having electricity to your home. And then after that, you're billed for how much you use. So this flat red line here, that's your fixed cost. And then on top of that, we add in the variable cost. So in total, this is our mixed cost. So the variable component on top of the fixed component becomes our, uh, becomes our total mixed cost. So if we were to break that down, because I know how you love algebra, we could look at this in a y equals a plus bx format. You may have learned y equals mx plus b. I really don't care which way you learned it, but we're going to refer to it as y equals a plus bx. So what those letters all represent, y is our y-axis, that's our total mixed cost. A is the total fixed cost, which is going to be that vertical intercept on the y-axis. Okay, so that's where this fixed cost intersects the y-axis. So that's our fixed component. The variable cost per unit is B. And we're going to multiply B by the level of activity, which is X. So if we're referring to our monthly utility charge, so if your fixed monthly utility cost is $40 and your variable cost is three cents per kilowatt hour, your monthly level of activity is 2,000 kilowatt hours, what's the amount of your utility bill? Well, you would probably just do this math in your head, but really what we're doing is y equals a plus bx. So start thinking of it that way. It's gonna help us understand our mixed costs. So our total cost equals the fixed component, $40, plus the variable charge times the number of units. So three cents times 2,000 kilowatt hours, that sounds like 60. So 40 plus 60, our total utility bill is a nice round textbooky $100. We're gonna revisit this whole Y equals A plus BX thing in a later chapter, specifically um, chapter five. Um, if this is something that looks scary and frightening to you and you are not a lover of math, maybe try to dust some of that off in the back of your brain, maybe pull out some notes from your algebra class. We are gonna be looking at um, you know, breaking down these uh, costs into their variable and fixed components, and you're going to be responsible for that. So we need to be comfortable with y equals a plus bx. We're going to be looking at that slope. That's the b rise over run. So if it feels like I'm speaking a foreign language to you, try to dust off some of your notes from algebra, and we will hit that up in more detail in chapter five. So next we need to look at cost classifications for making decisions. We're gonna take a look at differential costs, sunk costs, and opportunity cost. So as we talk about cost classifications for decision-making, a decision is any time we have to choose between alternatives. The goal of making decisions is to identify these costs that are either relevant or irrelevant to the decision. So we're choosing between different alternatives and we need to identify those that are relevant or irrelevant. 
So to make a decision, it's essential to have a grasp on these three, differential, sunk, and opportunity costs. So differential costs or incremental cost are the difference in cost between any two alternatives. A difference in revenue between two alternatives is what we call differential revenue. And of course, a difference in cost between two alternatives would be our differential costs. So we know differential revenue and differential costs. But here's the key. Both are always relevant to the decision. Why? Because they differ between the two alternatives. Um, you may have heard me say this before if you're in my financial accounting class, but we make decisions not based on what's the same, but based on what's different. So for example, if you were comparing two companies in your group project, you probably went over a lot of information about those two competing companies that it was the same, same, same between them. They had a lot of similarities, but we make decisions based on what's different about those two companies. So you would want to highlight what those differences are. So those would be the differential items in that analysis. So again, when we make decisions, we want to compare what's different. So that's why differential costs and differential revenues are so important. A sunk cost is one that's already been incurred and cannot be changed now or in the future. Well, based on that defini definition, it can't differ between the alternatives because it's already happened and it can't be changed. These costs should be ignored when making decisions. Now, sometimes that can be a tough one to get your brain around. You're like, well, of course, yeah, sunk costs, they should be ignored. But guess what? A lot of times we are emotional decision makers. We hold on to sunk costs and we don't want to let go of them. So let's say, for example, you buy a used car for $5,000 and you're pretty pleased with your purchase. You got yourself some decent transportation at a good price and now you've got this car. Well, you're driving along and it turns out that the tires are pretty much bald. So now you spend, let's say, $800 putting new tires on the car. And all right, now everything's going well again. And you're driving along and, oh, it's time for an oil change. Well, that's okay, that happens, right? And then you're driving the car more and you start hearing noises coming from under the hood. Uh-oh, turns out it needs a new transmission. Hmm, what's that gonna run? I'm not real good with car things, but let's say it's $1,500. Now, don't forget, you only paid $5,000 for this car, right? So you've put new tires on it for $800. You've had some basic costs like gas and oil changes, and now you're putting $1,500 into the transmission. Well, now everything's gotta be great, right? Well, you're driving along and something else is wrong. You take it in and it turns out it has a cracked engine block. Uh-oh. What's that going to run you? So how do we decide what to do next? Should we keep putting money into this car or do we walk away and put our money where it's going to be better spent? Well, what's better spent? Let's say it's going to be $2,500 to repair the engine. I'm just making numbers up. I don't know quite what that would cost. But so you put in $800 on tires some basic maintenance, oil change and gas, and $1,500 in a transmission into a car that you paid $5,000 for, and now you're faced with the decision of whether or not to put $2,500 in to repair the engine. So in your head, you're wrestling, well, gosh, I just have to make right on this. I spent $5,000 on this car. I can't just walk away from it now and all the other costs that I put into it. I can't just walk away from that now, can I? Mm. You're letting sunk cost influence your decision. You can't change that. You don't get your money back. It can't be changed now or in the future. The money that's already been spent has been spent. It's done. So with your $2,500, you need to make the decision that's gonna make the most sense for you to have transportation going forward. So maybe, maybe you do decide that is putting the $2,500 into the engine. Maybe that does make sense. Or maybe you decide to put $2,500 down on a new car and that's your down payment. Or maybe you decide to buy yourself a bike and a bus pass with your $2,500 and that's what you do for transportation. 
But what we can't do is cling on to that sunk cost irrationally and say, well, I already put so much in, I can't walk away from it now. Uh, if we're actually analyzing things correctly, yes, we can. So make sure when you're making those tough decisions that you ignore the sunk costs. Opportunity cost. That is the potential benefit that we give up when one alternative is chosen over another. So the costs are not usually found, not usually, they're not found in the accounting records, but they do need to be considered in every decision. So when we choose option A over option B, what is it that we're giving up? So what are we not getting? What are we not doing? There is an opportunity cost to everything. So for you students, what's the opportunity cost for you to incur by attending class? Maybe you're missing out on time with your family, sleep, uh, working and getting paid right now. So everything we do has an opportunity cost. And when it comes to decision making and accounting, while we may not have a spot for that on our financial statements, we do need to consider that opportunity cost. Let's try this one together. Quick check three. Suppose you're trying to decide whether to drive or take the train to Portland to attend a concert. You have ample cash to do either, but you don't want to waste money needlessly, right? Who does? Is the cost of the train ticket relevant in this decision? In other words, should the cost of the train ticket affect the decision of whether you drive or take the train to Portland? What do you think? Yes or no? Well, obviously, yes. The cost of the train ticket is relevant. We've got that for sure. Um, if we're going to drive, we're not going to spend the money on the train ticket. And if we're going to take the train, then we don't have to worry about the cost of driving. So um, that's going to be a differential cost. The next part, suppose, yeah, we got that part. Is the annual cost of licensing your car relevant in this decision? Hmm. So if you take the train, do you need to license your car annually? Probably yes. If you drive your car to Portland, are you going to license your car annually? Yes, so it doesn't differ between the alternatives. So either way, you should license your car. Um, now, I can't control whether or not you license your car. I had a student once raise their hand and say, well, I only license my car if I'm driving out of state. Like, really, that doesn't even make sense, but anyhow, you're supposed to license your car either way, so it wouldn't differ between the alternatives. So licensing cost is not relevant. And then how about this one? Stay with me here. This is a strange question. Suppose that your car could be sold right now for $5,000. Is this a sunk cost? Wait, what? Is selling your car a cost? It's a potential revenue is what it is. Um, based on that, I'm going to say no because it's not a cost at all. But I think what they're saying here, whether it's a cost or a revenue, it's something that's happening in the future. It's not something that happened in the past. So either way, your answer is no. It's not a sunk cost. It's not a cost at all. It's a potential revenue. Um, does it matter if you drive or take the train? I don't know. Maybe they're not gonna offer you $5,000 if you've got too many miles on the car, but um, either way, it doesn't appear to be a sunk cost. Kind of a strange one. So next we're gonna look at preparing income statements for a merchandising company using what we call traditional and contribution formats. Now you should be familiar with the traditional format, which looks like this, sales minus COGS equals gross margin. And then we subtract our selling and admin expense and we arrive at our net operating income. And that's primarily what you focused on in financial accounting and what we use for external reporting. But in managerial accounting, we really want to focus in on our contribution format income statement. And this version separates our cost by behavior. So instead of sales minus COGS, we take sales minus variable expenses equals our contribution margin. 
Then we subtract the fixed expenses and we arrive at net operating income. Now, if you notice, either way, the net operating income is the same. Sales are the same. So your top line and bottom line are exactly the same. It's just a matter of how do we arrange the expenses in the middle. So traditional format says we've got cost of goods sold and then everything else goes here as selling and admin. But contribution format says break it out by behavior. So we sales minus variable gives us CM, contribution margin, less fixed gives us net operating income. What this is foreshadowing, we're going to get deeper into this in later chapters, but anytime you're given a mixed cost, you have to break it out. You know why? Because there's no spot for mixed cost here. You have to break those mixed costs into variable expense and fixed expense so it fits in this contribution format. The issue with the traditional format is that there are costs in cost of goods sold. Some of them are variable, some of them are fixed, some of them are mixed. And there's expenses in selling and admin expense that some are variable, some are fixed, and some are mixed. So if I were to ask you, if I sell 100 more units, what will my net operating income be? Under a traditional format income statement, you really can't predict that. Mathematically, you don't have a way of doing that. But under the contribution format, you absolutely can predict that because your fixed expenses are going to stay the same fixed and your variable expenses are going to increase. So we actually could break that down and recompute this if we were selling 100 more units. And we're going to do exactly that in a later chapter. I won't bother you more with it now, but what I'm trying to tell you is this contribution format income statement is going to be extremely important throughout the book. Here they're pointing out we're going to use it in Chapter 5, Cost, Volume, Profit Analysis. We're going to use it in Chapter 6, more in Chapter 8, and then finally in Chapter 12. So it's important that you get a good grasp on that now and get some practice preparing those statements, traditional format versus contribution format, keeping in mind that Top and bottom lines are the same either way. It's just the arrangement of the expenses in the middle. All right, you guys, we have survived chapter one. Let me know if you have any questions. Study, study, and I will see you next time.